All right. If you guys want to turn to Revelation chapter 13, um, but just to jump right in in this, uh, it, it, picking up where we left off last week, and we're going to start in verse 11 tonight, but we're in this rather expanded pause between the seventh trumpet having been blown, I and mean, we've been going on about this for a couple of weeks now, between the, the seventh trumpet having been blown and just a series of seven bowls of judgment or wrath being poured out on the world. We're essentially paused in the greater chronology of events here between those two fairly major things. And in the interim, we've been getting introduced to these seven different personages, the last of which we're going to meet tonight. And as we've said, as we've been moving through, each one of these personages, each, each figure represents a larger arc of the greater story, the, the greater prophecy that's being unveiled to John in all this. And, and each thing that's being unveiled in this, it, it helps to really set the stage for the final movement of the tribulation. It's really going to start to pick up steam once we get into the next couple of chapters. But we're just kind of moving all the pieces into place. That's, that, that's the way the Lord unveiled this vision, just to have all the characters set so that they can all play the parts they're going to play through the end of all things, really. And in that, among these personages, we have seen that woman who was clothed with the sun, who stood upon the moon, who was crowned with these 12 stars, and of course she represented the nation of Israel. We saw a great red dragon, right? And, and he's going to come into play again tonight. Um, but this dragon represented Satan. And uh, it just came right out and said, that's who it is, right? It's, uh, we, we read that. Um, and then we saw a male child or, or a man child being born and then being called up into heaven. And this represents Jesus Christ. Then we saw Michael, uh, the archangel. Uh, Michael meaning who is like God, remember that? Uh, casting Satan out of heaven. And then we saw the persecuted offspring of that woman, of that nation Israel, and that represented a remnant of the nation Israel. And we're going to return to them in just uh, a couple of weeks here. And last week, we saw this great beast rising out of the sea, <laughs> representative of the Antichrist. And just a, a key section we kind of focused on toward the close last week, we, we, we talked about in Matthew chapter 4, just that incredible exchange between Satan and Jesus. When Satan is tempting Jesus, and he took Jesus up on an exceedingly high mountain in Matthew chapter 4, and he showed Jesus all of the kingdoms of the world in all of their glory. And the devil said to Jesus at that time, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And of course, Jesus rejected him. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, he said, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. That, that was the reply given this offer of all of the kingdoms of the world. And in all of that, the Antichrist, this beast that we saw last week, the Antichrist will receive exactly what had been offered to the real Jesus Christ, all the way back at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. The Antichrist will receive that offer. He will receive what our Lord flatly rejected. He will receive all the kingdoms of the world in their glory, and he will do so selling his life out to worship Satan in it. Uh, but we saw some detail on the beast last week. It had seven heads. These are figurative things. This is clearly when the symbology comes into play. I don't think we're going to be talking about a seven-headed human. Uh, <laughs> that's not the way. And again, when we get to chapter 17, it will get into more description as to what this actually means. But this beast has seven heads, one of which was if it had been mortally wounded. And that deadly wound we saw was healed, and all the world followed the beast in what we read last week. Everyone who is left on the face of the earth at that point, everybody who is left, everyone who's not been sealed to God, they will see in this character that we met last week, they will see a person um, who offers them a shred of hope amidst all of the trauma and all of the horror, it's in the midst of all this chaos that they've been going through for three and a half years. They will see in this man a supposed Messiah who who really does some, he's going to be very appealing to them in a lot of respects. He, re, he will require of them no denial of self and, and no deferment of self. He, he will require of them no repentance of sin, I mean, no, no real change to their lifestyle. He will offer some of the sense of stability that they have been chasing their entire lives. But in return, 
you will worship him. That's, that's the exchange that will happen there. It'll be exactly what they think they want, and the people of the world. It'll be exactly what they think they've been waiting for, but in reality, he will be the worst thing to address their actual need, their, their eternal need. And that's the thing. You know, the Antichrist, as we saw last week, in his resurrection, and people are just going to go nuts over the fact that this guy will appear to be resurrected from dead. Um, he, he will serve the desires of the flesh of mankind in his return from the dead. He will feed the desires of the flesh. Whereas the real Christ, you know, our Christ, with his resurrection, he dealt with the desires of of the flesh. He, he solved the problem of our flesh. A significant, significant difference between the two. But as we saw, the people will choose the Antichrist. It's, he's exactly what they think they want, and they will worship the dragon. And we closed last week knowing that the Antichrist will be given power to make war against the saints and to command every people, every tribe, and every nation, and to speak great things and blasphemies, and he will be given authority to do this specifically for that time period of three and a half years. So all of that being established, we were left with a statement of encouragement. You know, he who has an ear, let him hear. Essentially, hear this and hold this, and hold it tightly. You know, it's the way it was phrased was, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword, with the sword must be killed. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. In essence, hold on in all this. As, as the people on earth are seeing this play out, hold on. As, as we see the forerunners and the precursors of this playing out, hold on. Don't lose heart. Don't lose your temper. Everything that we see happening, I mean, every single outrage, every blasphemy, every push outward of the boundaries of cultural acceptability, God sees all of it, and he sees it to a much deeper degree than we can in everything that is happening, everything that we see happen, uh, it will be brought to account. It will be brought to account. And we, we closed with that verse last week out of Psalm 27, and verse 14, which says simply, wait on the Lord, and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And that word wait just has so much uh, gravity weight to it. In, in the Hebrew, the word is hava. Uh, literally, it means to bind together, specifically by twisting or entwining. We should wait on God like that, uh, bound to Him, entwined, and entrusting our futures into His hands, you know, and watching His work as He carries us forward. We should be twisted to Him bound to him, braided to him with our lives, and he will hold us together. But here, starting in verse 11 this week, it says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. So in all of this, again, just a repeated theme really throughout all of Scripture, but including this letter, Satan is kind of the king of facsimiles. You know, he, he just, he, he's the king of the almost there, right? He, he, he's always trying to copy what God has done, always trying to claim what God has done. He's never quite attaining the fullness of it, or really never drawing close to the fullness of it. But what's being established here is, as we read through chapter 13 here, it is really an unholy trinity of this earthly kingdom that Satan is putting together. And this kingdom, as, as this is all playing out, as it's all playing out, this kingdom is on the cusp of falling mightily. It's on the cusp of just falling apart completely. But Satan, that, that, that red dragon that we saw a couple of chapters ago, he, he serves in this, in this unholy trinity here, he serves kind of as God the Father in that particular relationship. He, he's the head of this particular trinity. And he empowers the other two figures within it. And we saw the first one last week, the Antichrist, who was empowered and energized by the dragon. It's one who receives worship alongside the dragon. Effectively, the Antichrist will serve as the son, as, as the child, the, the Messiah of this false one world religion, the great deliverer of the world, although he will not be a deliverer at all. Now, he can't deliver the world from anything eternal, anything of substance, but he can deliver the desires of the world to the world's people, and that's what he will do. He will be the Messiah in this particular, um, this particular form of Trinity. He is not the actual Messiah. <laughs> and now we meet this second beast, 
who comes up out of the earth. And some people think that that tends to speak toward the idea that he comes up out of the nation of Israel, because the land does, through Scripture, it tends to represent the nation of Israel. Take that for what you will. Um, I don't know. (laughs) But he will come up out of the earth, and he will have two horns like a lamb. And those horns suggest authority. We've seen that throughout. Uh, Perhaps a religious authority, but the horns themselves lack crown. So there's no political power that this second beast will carry. He will have religious authority, perhaps spiritual authority, but not political authority. And he will have speech like a dragon. So effectively, this this beast will carry forth the message of this evil trinity to the world. You know, he looks like a lamb, but he speaks like the devil, speaks like a dragon. He serves as the religious support, a, a religious leader to work with the grand political ruler, this, this conquering king who will command the kingdoms of the, the world. This beast will be his religious support. <laughs> As we will see, this second beast will garner great influence, great sway over the people of the world. Effectively, the second beast draws people toward the first beast. You should be putting your finger on right now what this second beast represents in this unholy trinity. <laughs> He's not unlike the Holy Spirit in the function in this particular relationship here. He will, he will preach the message of this king. He will draw people toward this king. He will serve as the great kind of catch-all for this king. The second beast will be both prophet and priest of the king's message. The first beast will be the actual king. And in that, you know, people, people will look at this second beast. They will see the prophethood of him. They will see the priesthood of him. And in that, there's some debate. There are some who will read this section here, and they will interpret this second beast himself as the Antichrist. They'll say, he's the prophet and the priest. He must be the Antichrist. But if you hear that type of thinking, if you hear that type of thought being spoken out loud, keep in mind, the people will worship the dragon and the first beast. They will not worship this second beast. So there are some issues in that line of thinking. Additionally, it is the first beast who has that apparent mortal wound and is then resurrected. It is the first beast who will rule the nations for a brief period of time. And if you fast forward, uh, when we get to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20 there, it says the beast and the false prophet are cast alive into the lake of fire. They are both cast separately into the same place, but he's identified clearly there in chapter 19 as the false prophet. And then the devil follows into the same place in chapter 20. So all three of them end up in the same place, but when they are identified there, the second beast is identified as the false prophet. But as in all things, in all this, this is kind of the theme of the entire night, Satan submits inherently lesser, inherently inferior forms of our God before the people of the world. They will always be lesser. Whereas our Lord Jesus, he is king and priest and prophet all in one. He serves all three functions himself, and he does so um, (laughs) perfectly. But that's our Lord. Moving on in verse 12 here, it says, And he, this second beast, exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs, so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword, and lived. Uh, So the second beast here performs great signs uh, to the extent where he'll be able to even call fire down to the earth from heaven. He will be impressive in his magnitude. He'll be impressive in his power. He will be, though, a deceiver, just as his father, the dragon, is. And there will be a definite limit to his power. But in verse 15, it says, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And this is just kind of a continuing peculiarity that we we saw last week at first. We talked about how one of the heads, one of the seven heads of the Antichrist will appear as if it had been mortally wounded. And the phrasing was very specific there. It will appear as if it had been mortally wounded. 
and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled. This beast this week is granted the power to give breath. I mean, see this here, to give breath to the image of the beast. Now, that image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And just like last week, I don't know how this all fits together. It's a, I can't give you a, a perfectly fit together timeline of what this is actually saying. It's, we just have to read it for what it is. But John very purposefully does not say here he was granted power to give breath to the beast. He doesn't say that. <laughs> it is to the image of the beast. And in that there, you can run into some really wild stuff if you read on this section of Scripture. There are a lot of theories. There's a lot of explanations here. People suggest a wide range of things as to what this image of the beast actually is. They'll say maybe it's an audio animatronic, you know, <laughs> and it could be. Uh, they, they will set this, they, they'll, say they'll, they'll set up basically a droid in the temple to, to be there, to be present there for the people who come to worship there while the Antichrist actually rules in person from elsewhere. That's a theory that's out there. Some say maybe it's a hologram. I suppose that's a possibility. One particularly creepy idea is that perhaps the Antichrist actually does die, right? But this false prophet is able to somehow reanimate him into something resembling life, almost like a well-polished zombie, you know, a well-presented zombie. I don't know. I mean, this is just some of the stuff that's out there. It is best to go with what we have in Scripture, it's best to go with just the idea that God will fill in the blanks in his timing, because he will. He will. And there's a lot here. We can throw out a lot of conjecture, and we can end up some pretty crazy places in that. But this second beast is said simply to have been granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause whoever doesn't worship that image to be killed. So a whole lot of people in this, and we're going to see more in this in the coming chapters, but a whole lot of people in this are going to die. They're, they're, they're not going to worship this beast. They're not going to take uh, this, this worldwide system of worship for what it is, and, and they're going to reject it. And they'll be hunted down, and they will be killed. They're, there's going to be a great multitude of martyrs, again, in all of this. Anyone refusing to worship the image of this beast will be systematically put to death. And again, this is a tragic time. It is a tragic time, but they will stand for their faith. And it will cost them something, um, it will cost them dearly, it will cost them everything to stand um, for Jesus Christ. And this prophet will have great power from the same source that the Antichrist receives his power. You know, again, this is an unholy trinity that is working together here. And remember, this is all happening, as we've said, it's all happening within a matter of maybe a handful of days, maybe a handful of weeks, this shift toward worldwide worship of one false Christ. This is all happening as those two witnesses that we met probably about a month ago now, those two witnesses have been overcome and killed by the Antichrist. And they were left in the streets for three and a half days, but then they were resurrected and called up into heaven. This is all happening after that has just happened. And the Antichrist then enters the temple and assumes the place of God in the Holy of Holies, and he desolates the temple. But during the lead-up to that, you know, in, in the ministry of the two witnesses, the two witnesses portrayed great power to the people of the world. We read when we were covering them back in chapter 11, I believe it was, we read that they had fire that proceeded from their mouths to devour their enemies. We read that they had the power to shut heaven from raining. Remember that? We read that they had the power to turn waters to blood, these two witnesses. They had the power to strike the earth with plagues, however they saw fit, these two witnesses. And the world, as we saw, they will hate these two witnesses. They will despise them, and they will celebrate their death like it's Christmas, you know. So Satan now, those two witnesses having moved on, having been called up into heaven, Satan now brings in his copy to do their work. You know, he gives power to the Antichrist, and he gives power to this false prophet to call fire from the sky to deceive the earth. But again, as in all things, the work of Satan will prove to be lesser than the work of God. And that is it's just such a repeated theme throughout Scripture. We see it whenever God unveils signs and wonders. It's, we saw it when, when this was happening in Egypt under Pharaoh, when God was bringing signs and wonders on the land through Moses and Aaron, two witnesses there in Exodus chapters 7 through 9. You know, at first the magicians can kind of keep up. 
with what those two witnesses were doing at that time. But, but even then, they were only able to imitate the signs and the wonders that were being brought on the land. They were not able to remedy any of the signs and wonders that God was bringing. Now, you know the story well. Aaron's staff turned into a serpent. The magicians turned their staffs into a serpent. And then Aaron's staff ate the, the, the magician's staffs. So, it's, it, clearly, God's work was better. <laughs> the magicians replicated the water being turned to blood. But it is interesting, they couldn't turn the blood back into water. So, uh, all you've done is made more bloody water <laughs> or, or blood that cannot be uh, consumed. And they replicated, these magicians, they replicated the calling out of the frogs, which Moses and Aaron had done first. But again, they couldn't remove the plagues. They couldn't remove the frogs from the land. So Pharaoh, in all of that, and this would just be a huge, if I'm, if I'm his employee, if I'm his magician and I see this happen, I, th- I figure my job's probably done forever. Now, um, Pharaoh, after they couldn't remove those frogs, he asks Moses and Aaron to get rid of them. <laughs> Call on your God to remove these frogs, and, and they do. <laughs> Moses and Aaron intercede for the, the land then, and the frogs die out, and we're told that they're piled up and, and they stink. <laughs> um, but <laughs> by the time it gets to turning the dust of the earth into lice, it's the fourth plague. The magicians can't keep up. Uh, they can't do it anymore. Uh, they could, they could kind of create a facsimile of life in the serpents, but when it comes to a flying creature with all the aerodynamics of the wings and everything, where it has to actually be life being brought out of the dust of the earth, I can't do this. And they, say, they say outright in that moment, this is the finger of God. And that's always going to be true. There comes a point always where Satan cannot keep up. Where Satan falls short. That's, that's never going to not be true. He will always fall short. But in verse 16 here, this false prophet, it says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. It's very interesting in the phrasing here. If you recall all the way back to chapter 6, right, as the sixth seal was opened up, and there was that great earthquake, and you remember this, the sun became black as sackcloth, the moon became as blood, the stars fell to the earth, and the sky receded as a scroll. Remember there in chapter 6, verse 15, we saw this, this phrasing there, the king's the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, and every slave and every free man, they there cried out to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the land. You remember that? From the wrath of the lamb, not the land, the lamb. See this here in what we're reading. It is the small and great. It is the, the rich and the poor. It is the free and the slave. Again, consider their plight in all of this. Having seen all the horror and all the trauma of the past three and a half years, at what point, having called on the mountains and the rocks for protection, for covering, having called out, right, just fall on us and hide us, <laughs> and having not found that hope that they were looking for, the same grouping of people now, they now see a glimmer of hope, (laughs) albeit false. (laughs) The Antichrist will appear in this moment to have power over death. You know that all of these that we're reading about, they had sought to hide from the face of him who sits on the throne. They had sought to hide from the wrath of the Lamb, and now they will sell their lives willingly into the service of this false Messiah, one who was willing to pose on that throne, pose in the throne room of the temple, They will sell out to him for even the slightest shred of hope. And they do so in order to maintain their livelihoods and to stock their pantries, right? And people are always trying to spot what this mark is going to be. You know, another place, you you read enough, you're going to land all kinds of wild places. What we know for sure, it will be a marking. It will be his name or the number of his name. So one of three things, but all of them in the form of a mark on the hand, the right hand, or on the forehead. The word for mark here in the Greek is chiragma. It means literally a scratch or an etching that is a stamp. It is something permanent. It's something visible. It speaks specifically 
As it was used in the time, it speaks specifically of a badge of servitude. You know, it was the same word that they used at the time for the brands that they would place on servants. It's, you went into servitude of somebody, they would brand you. This was the word that they used for what that process was. And it, of course, there's a lot of conjectures to what this mark is going to be, but it will be a mark. And it will be something visible. It will be something that people around can look at it and know who you belong to in this. And it will signify, and what we read here, it will signify an act of worship of one specific being. A mark of worship toward one. Toward, toward one being. A selling of one's life into the possession of another. It's, it is the idea of, I will now serve this person with my entire life with no promise of ever being free from it. And certainly, certainly, we see precursors of this in our time right now. I mean, it's, it's not hard to find them. <laughs> it's not hard at all to find them. Things are less than a hop and a skip and a jump away from being the real system that we read about here. That's all it's going to take is just for, let's do, let's do it this way, and that's the way it'll be. <laughs> our culture, as you can surely see, our culture is being conditioned into accepting such a mark in order to be able to purchase and do business on their own. It's, it's the, the conditioning is happening now, and it has been for many years. It has been for many years. We're largely cashless already. We're seeing it happen right in front of us and continue to advance right in front of us. And really, the concepts being presented here used to require a whole lot more explanation. They used to require a whole lot more theory, but hardly, it's hardly even a second thought now because we can see it so clearly. Our bank accounts now, our financial records are accessible from everywhere to anyone, right? You know, we can make purchases just by tapping a card against the surface. The technology is all there. Uh, my wife and I and our kids, uh, we were in the Bay Area a couple of months ago, and we went through an unmanned toll booth, and there was a camera at the booth that took a picture of our license plate, and we received a bill for that toll in the mail a week later. Is that the way things go now? They know who you are. They know where you are. They know where to find you. <laughs> it just is what it is. All of our medical records now are centralized and accessible from anywhere. We can implant microchips in pets and, and in people. All of the technology, all the pieces are there for this to just be a couple of quick clicks away from being a reality. And again, in all this, this is something that must happen. This is the direction that the world is headed, and we can clearly see it now. But this mark, this visible mark, it will be on the right hand or on the forehead. I mean, there's qualifiers here that must be for it to be what it, Scripture says it is, right hand or the forehead. So take it for what you will. It will be a sign. It will be visible. It will be a sign to anyone else who you belong to. It will be a sign to anyone else who you worship with your life. It must be that for it to be what we're reading about here. In verse 18, it says, Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. And again, that line alone has caused all kinds of... Uh, time expenditure over the many generations. Uh, let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. And many, many, many over the many generations have spent a lot of time attempting to be that one who has that understanding to calculate this number. And there are interesting theories out there, some of which may have some, some credence to them, and there are some wacky theories out there uh, people use all manner of different numerologies. They'll, they'll, they'll add up the letters in, in the Greek, or they'll add up the, the letters in the Hebrew. Uh, <laughs> they have all kinds of different formulas and different codes to, to tell you exactly who this is going to be. I know exactly who it is because I'm the one who has this wisdom to calculate this number. Uh, and think about this. Since this letter was first distributed 1900 some odd years ago, the church has been puzzling over what that calculation is. And there has been, in every generation, in every church body since, there has been somebody who thinks they're that one that knows exactly how to calculate that number. Uh, just as a caution, if you decide that you're that one, <laughs> and you decide you're going to go down some of these trails, here's just a sampling of some of the folks who have been pointed out as surely the, the Antichrist, based on the formulas and the computations and the prophecies that whoever um, has read into it. Uh, people thought it may have been the, the Roman Emperor Caligula. Who, who lived before the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem. He actually issued an order to erect a statue, an image of himself in the Jewish temple. That was there, that piece of the prophecy. It could have been him, they thought. He was considered an antichrist posthumously. That's where you get a lot of your uh, theorists who say this all happened already. They'll, they'll point to him. 
And there were those who thought it might have been Caesar Nero, as he just inflicted tremendous persecution on the Christian church. There were those who thought it might have been Caesar Domitian, who as this letter is being recorded, he's the one who is mandating that he be worshipped as God. And this ruler over the Roman Empire, that he be worshipped as God. People thought it was him. (laughs) People tend to attach their suspicions to the political leaders of the time. Throughout the generations, we think it's this one because they're in power. And they thought it may have been Oliver Cromwell for a period of time. All manner of religious figures over the years. People thought it might have been John Knox. And people thought it might have been Martin Luther. (laughs) And people thought, over the many years, they thought it has been many of the Roman Catholic popes. There were those who thought it was Muhammad. And clearly there were those who thought it was Adolf Hitler. There were those who pointed to John F. Kennedy. And there were those who presented a good case for Henry Kissinger, Mikhail Gorbachev. Each of our last seven presidents and a notable spouse (laughs) have all been thrown into the idea that maybe I've got the number computed and it's this one right here. Ray Stedman wrote, through the history of the church, we have exhibited a shortage of insight, but no shortage of imagination in this particular avenue. Warren Wiersbe wrote, if you work hard enough, you can make almost any name fit. That's, and that's the game right there. You can make any name fit into this if you work hard enough. The leaders of the early church, uh, the, the generation just after John, after John finally goes to his rest at home in heaven, uh, John in all of this, he was the last one to have walked with Jesus and to have served with Jesus and to have ministered with Jesus. In this whole letter that we're going through right here, it is a turning of the page into the next chapter, the next generation of the church. The, the leaders of the early church, having this letter in hand, they took the approach that this wasn't something for the church to know just yet. The, the things we need to know through the rest of this whole text, they're presented pretty, pretty clearly. I mean, there's, there's little doubt left as to those. The things that we don't know, their approach was, those things will take their shape in the Lord's timing. Those things will be fully revealed in the Lord's perfect timing. And this certainly appears to be one of those. But certainly in all this, keep watch. You know, because there are many who will fit that mold, but only one is going to be the one who actually carries it out. Only one. I was chatting about this section with Justin this week, and and something that had been pointed out to him some years ago, why there are so many over the years who could potentially fit that mold, why, why every generation of the church could have one that they thought that it was, and so many potential forerunners, even of the mark over the many generations. It had been said to him, the Antichrist could be anybody. I mean, think about this. Satan will always be grooming people. Satan will always be positioning people and tempting people to potentially be these beasts that we've met over the past two weeks. Satan will always be doing that work. But in that, this is a point that I had never considered before, and maybe you have. I hadn't. Satan doesn't know the day or the hour any more than we do. Think about that. Only God the Father knows the day or the hour. So Satan always has someone ready. He's always working on someone. He's always moving someone into place. He always has someone waiting in the wings. He always has someone on the rise. He always has someone who could rise to power with the right circumstances. That's his game. He's always attempting to move someone in. That's why we always think we see somebody, because that's what he's doing. Already tonight, we saw he tried to do it with Jesus. I mean, see that to be true. When we looked at Matthew chapter 4, that's exactly what he tried to do with Jesus, to move him into place, to be his antichrist, to give him all the kingdoms of the world if you would just fall and worship me. And Jesus was having none of it. (laughs) So whenever we see someone who could fit the bill, understand there's an element of truth there, and there always will be. But absent of the rapture of the church, Satan doesn't know exactly who it's going to be. He doesn't know when that time is coming. And when whoever his guy is dies, well, that wasn't him. (laughs) Got to move on to the next one. He makes the same offer again and again and again through all the generations. So that is why throughout history, there have always been those who it seems like it could be them. And there will always be those who could potentially fit that mold. And the thing is, is when the timing does come, Satan will pounce when these guys, who they actually are, when they present themselves in reality, when the door finally opens for him, he'll be ready and he'll have his guys ready. But in all that, God knows exactly who it's going to be. And he knows exactly when 
they will rise to prominence. It will be apparent to those of the time when they do. What the meaning of this number is here. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is six, six, six. And again, if you take nothing else away tonight, take away this. The strongest lesson here, <laughs> it is simply this number, 666, it is lesser. It is, it is <laughs> inferior to God's number of perfection and completion. It is lesser at every level. Throughout Scripture, we see God repeat seven in sets of three. At key moments all throughout Scripture, seven, seven, seven. And just consider, let's just consider a couple right off the, right off the cuff. Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, it says there, you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it to you. In Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3, it says, And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, set it apart, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So consider just the significance of that one event, the fulfillment of a perfect creation. Sin was not there yet. At the fulfillment of a perfect creation, God presented three sevens for us to ponder. Three references to the seventh day. He ended his work he rested, he blesses the day, and sets it apart. In Joshua, as the nation of Israel marches around the city of Jericho, they march around the city each day for seven days. And each day, seven priests blow seven trumpets at the conclusion of the journey. Three sevens. And then on the last day, God has the nation march seven times around that city, and at the conclusion of each lap, he has seven priests blow seven trumpets at the end of each of these seven laps. Three sevens. And of course, all those walls came down. Right now in Revelation, we are in the midst of seven seals being opened, seven trumpets being blown, and seven bowls being poured out as our Lord redeems and reclaims the earth. Seven, seven, seven. It is the perfection of the Trinity being represented in a single number, three sevens, three complete beings working in union together, seven, seven, seven. Man's number is six. Mankind was created on the sixth day. And God's perfect rest, God's completion and the perfection of his creation, that came on the seventh day. Man came on the sixth. So the Trinity that we're seeing in this chapter, it will exhibit a lot of power. It will exhibit a level of influence that the world has never seen, but it will be lesser, infinitely lesser than the perfection and the completion of our God. All three of these numbers that we have seen tonight in this chapter, each one of these sixes, so to speak, they will be representative of a creature, each one, not a creator. We see the dragon, we see the beast with seven heads, we see the beast with lamb's horns in a dragon's speech. Each one of them created, and not a single one of them creator. Each one of them will ultimately be judged. Each one of them will ultimately be answerable to the real and the living and the eternal God. Each one will be fatally lesser than its holy and its perfect counterpart. <laughs> For all the mystery and the intrigue that surrounds these two figures in this chapter, and for all the mystery and the intrigue that surrounds this mark in this chapter, and you can go down some pretty wild rabbit holes chasing all the interpretations and chasing down all the possibilities, the most important takeaway here is that this trinity that we see in this chapter, it is less than the holy trinity. It doesn't even come close. It is less than the one true triune God. This chapter has been the revelation, the unveiling of the Antichrist, but it is just one small part of the larger revelation, the larger unveiling of Jesus Christ. And that is our focus as we go through this book. We wait for him. We watch for him. We bear the marks of servitude to him, to the real Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture, it says there, you are not your own. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. We bear the marks of his servitude. We bear the marks of his ownership over our lives. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 
possessive. <laughs> they are not gods themselves. There's an apostrophe there. <laughs> Exercise discernment in all this. I mean, keep an eye out. It's interesting, but don't panic. There's always going to be somebody it could be until it actually is the one that it is. Keep watch. There's only one who will reach this particular stage, but there will be many, and there have been many, who come in the spirit of Antichrist. If you want to turn a couple of pages to the left to 1 John, we're going to close here. A little bit of a shorter study tonight. If you get to 1 John chapter 2, drop down to verse 18, and just keep in mind too, this is still John. You know, John's writing down Revelation for us. He wrote this in 1 John at the leading of the Holy Spirit. So it's still John's hand pinning these words in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, it says, Little children, it is the last hour. It is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. The fact that there are so many, we know that makes it the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest, that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So these Antichrists, the very presence of them speaks to the idea that it is the last hour. And keep in mind these words, little children, it is the last hour. Those words were written 1,900 years ago. <laughs> it's been the last hour for a long time now, but it is still the last hour. It says here, who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. And the prevailing message of the Antichrist, the prevailing message of the false prophet will be simply, hey, we can do this. We're going to be okay. Mankind can be self-sufficient. We don't need God. We don't need Jesus Christ. They will deny the Father and the Son. And there are so many who come in that spirit every single day. And those are the spirits that we must test. Do they think they can do it on their own? Do they think they can get to that place of peace without Jesus, without God the Father? That is the spirit of Antichrist. Consider, if you move up to verse 15, consider what the preceding verses leading into that section say in 1 John. Verse 15, it says, Do not love the world. This is a command. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. That right there, those three verses, that is our call. That is the answer to the spirit of the Antichrist, to the Antichrist himself. It's the answer to the false prophet. It is the answer to any Antichrist, anyone who would deny the Father or the Son, don't love the world. Don't love the things in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. None of this is of God the Father. It's all of the world. And a beautiful phrase here, the world is passing away. The world is passing away. Don't love it. <laughs> and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. He who does the will of God abides forever. So, what is the will of God? John recorded some help for us in that as well. <laughs> and Jesus' words in John chapter 6, verses 38 through 40, I'm just going to read them. Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That should define how we live. Not to do our own will, but to do the will of him who has sent us. 
that everyone should see the Son, and that those who do might have everlasting life, far beyond this world which is passing away. So, for these final three and a half years, we know there will be one world government, there will be one system of worship, one global system of worship, there will be one world economy, and there will be these two key figures empowered by one very old nemesis spearheading the entire system. So, next time, we will move into some pronouncements, then we'll get into chapter 15, which will pick up with the final prelude to the bold judgments, and we will go from there. I suspect we're going to be done with this book in September, maybe October. So um, let's go ahead and pray. Now, Father God, we just um, we thank you so much for who you are, and we thank you just for that constant assurance, Lord, that there's never going to be anything that overcomes you. There's going to be plenty of things that we fall short to, Lord, but you're never going to fail us. You will always be fighting for us. You'll be going before us, Lord. And for anything that the world might bring, anything that the enemy might bring, Lord, there's nothing that will eclipse you. And we just, we thank you for who you are. We just ask for your wisdom as we move through this world, Lord. We ask for your protection these next couple of days. For each one here, Lord, I know there's people heading back to work tomorrow coming out of work today, already exhausted in the middle of the week, Lord. I just ask that you give them a special, um, just uh, extra measure of your blessing and your endurance and your strength this week, just to get them through what they need to get through this week. Uh, Lord, give them quick hands, expand their time, uh, just expand their hearts, Lord, just to be able to share who you are with those that you placed around them. And just ask that you bless the people here and bless the people listening, Lord, and truly that you just be lifted on high and glorified for who you are. Just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.